The Atlantic, at 158 years old, is one of America's oldest magazines. Founded as a monthly of literature, art and politics, it has long been noted for the quality of its articles and has been contributed to by a long line of distinguished editors and authors. On February 1, 1862, it published abolitionist Julia Ward Howe's Battle Hymn of the Republic and William Parker's slave narrative, The Freedman's Story, in February and March 1866. Francis H. Underwood, The Atlantic's founder, came up with the project during his time as assistant editor at a publishing house in Boston, Massachusetts. That it published pieces on the topic of slavery so early after its founding is no coincidence. Underwood was an ardent supporter of the Free Soil Party, a short-lived, single-issue political party campaigning solely on an anti-slavery platform. It was not a pro-abolitionist party, rather it distanced itself from abolitionism and avoided the moral problems implicit in slavery, instead emphasising the threat slavery would pose to free white labour and northern businessmen in the new western territories. It was in order to further this anti-slavery cause that Underwood set about founding the Atlantic Monthly. The Atlantic Monthly began publication in November 1857. As well as its anti-slavery focus, it quickly gained a following from discussions on education and other national reform issues, as well as for its high quality fiction and poetry. In its founding statement, the Atlantic pledged to be the organ of no party or clique, but to honestly endeavour to be the exponent of what its conductors believe to be the American idea, concerned with freedom, national progress and honour, whether public or private. Since Underwood, the publication has passed through several hands. In 1980, the magazine was acquired by Mortimer Zuckerman, as the New Yorker tells us in their piece about him. He was a property magnate and founder of Boston Properties, current owner of New York's Daily News and US News and World Report, whose current net worth is $2.8 billion, according to Forbes, again shown here by the New Yorker. In 1999, Zuckerman reluctantly sold The Atlantic for $10 million to David G. Bradley, who the New York Times describes as independently wealthy from the public offering of a corporate research firm he founded at age 26. When he bought The Atlantic, he already owned the National Journal and he's owned both ever since. In the New York Times piece, Web Focus Helps Revitalize The Atlantic, they report that it lost $4.5 million in its first year under Mr. Bradley's ownership, and that figure grew worse. In 2005, Bradley moved the magazine from its home in Boston to Washington, D.C., as the Washington Post reports, in order to form the Atlantic Media Company hub, resulting in an almost complete overhaul of its staff. By this point, it is estimated he had lost around $30 million on the venture altogether, as Mashable reports. Then things began to turn around. Bradley hired New York Times correspondent James Bennett, as his own newspaper reported, to be editor in 2006, and publisher of the week, Justin Smith, in 2007. The two of them implemented a new digital first strategy that would transform the Atlantic, again shown by this piece in Mashable. They began by taking down the website's paywall in January 2008 and publishing the writing of Big Voices to offer analysis and opinion on the headline news of the previous day. Such voices included Andrew Sullivan, who came to account for more than a quarter of the Atlantic's website traffic by the time he left in 2011. As part of their move to digital focus, they collapsed their digital and print sales and marketing teams, no longer with separate targets. They also launched several spin-off sites, including the Atlantic Wire, now The Wire, an aggregating site for opinion news, and the Atlantic City, an urban focus site. This digital move has proved to be hugely successful. Not only does the Atlantic now turn a sizable profit, both its digital and print readership has rocketed. So how did it manage this? In the president of the company's own words, we imagined ourselves as a venture capital-backed startup in Silicon Valley whose mission was to attack and disrupt the Atlantic, as reported by the New York Times. Along with video and interactive digital content, the Atlantic have developed their website, which now has the feel not of a 158-year-old highbrow monthly, but what it has become, a slick, young, 21st century, middle-brow, liberal multimedia site. Along with their digital turn, the Atlantic have also changed the focus of their content somewhat. In 2005, they announced that they would no longer regularly run fiction, instead running a fiction issue annually. They also reduced the number of print issues per year from 12 to 10. And with this changing direction came new writers. One of the individuals arguably partially responsible for the Atlantic's success is their national correspondent, ta Coates. It was partly on the pages of the Atlantic that he made himself a superstar, 
with a recent high-profile cover story on the case for reparations for slavery, accompanied by complimentary video content, which was shared 256,000 times via Facebook. Coates' piece on the black family in an age of mass incarceration, at 17,000 words long, was the longest piece The Atlantic have published in over a decade. It was also accompanied by video content, including an animated interview with Coates. Coates wrote annotations that were incorporated into the article, which could be clicked to reveal the full text. It also included the text of the 1965 report, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, reproduced online with clickable annotations as a supplement to Coates' piece. This is not the only place The Atlantic is experimenting with video content. Based on the magazine feature of the same name, they now have a video series called The Big Question, in which they feature various experts and academics to talk about issues such as what's the best tool we have to stop environmental disaster? These kind of features are where the Atlantic's politics and audience can perhaps be seen most clearly. In a video titled, Has the US Reached a Tipping Point on Police Violence? They feature a number of people critical of the police's practices, such as activists Clifton Kinney and Ta-Nehisi Coates. But the use of the term we by Professor Bruce Weston gives a clear indication of who the Atlantic considers to be its readers. He notes who are most likely to be the victims of police violence before going on to refer to what we know and what we need to know. The only person in the video who claims that things are not as bad as they seem is former NYPD Commissioner Ray Kelly, who The Atlantic presumably felt could offer a valid and objective opinion on the matter. The Atlantic's coverage of the current presidential nominations race is also telling with regards to where its sympathies lie. In a video called Why Do Millennials Love Bernie, senior editor Derek Thompson offers a theory of a revolution of rising expectations in which the appeal of Bernie Sanders' billionaire bashing, wealth redistributing, anti-establishment platform is appealing to millennials, it is implied, because they are impatient and demanding and that reality will inevitably catch up. In another article titled Bernie is not a socialist and America is not capitalist, not, as you might reasonably assume, a piece of satire, the author argues that socialism, whenever and wherever it has been tried, ended in disaster, in distinction, presumably, to the disaster-free utopia in which we are currently blissfully living. In a particularly contemptuous piece, Millennials' political views don't make any sense, the Atlantic's disapproval of young Bernie supporters is really laid bare. The article starts with three reasons for Millennials' left-leaning politics. First, they're young and poor, and young poor people are historically more liberal. Second, they're historically non-white. Non-white Americans are historically liberal too. Third, their white demo is historically liberal compared to older white voters. None of which, of course, are actually reasons, but simply the identification of trends. The article continues to state that the millennials don't know what they're talking about when it comes to economics giving one the impression that The Atlantic is not hoping to win any such naive dreamers to be part of its more educated and Hillary-supporting readership. Just to drive the point home, the article ends with the entertaining assertion that millennials don't know what socialism is, but they think it sounds nice. They are, it is implied, wrong. But The Atlantic does not spend all of its time belittling millennial dreamers. As part of its ongoing digital development, The Atlantic has also launched a new project called Next America, which looks at how changing demography is changing a nation, including sections on the economy, workforce, criminal justice, culture, early childhood, higher education, and communities. In Next America's economy section, articles like, are you in the shrinking middle class? Take this two-step test, present statistics about the shift in wealth distribution in the US. Median income for middle-income households fell by 4% in 2014 compared to 2000. Their median wealth also dropped by 28% from 2001 to 2013. Far more alarming is the growth in the lowest income tier, from 16% in 1971 to 20% today. That means one in five American adults is in the lowest income category. The silver lining in all this, the article claims, seems to be that nearly one in 10 adults are now part of the highest income tier. Inequality isn't so bad, as long as there's a 10% chance we can be filthy rich, right? In the workforce section, likewise, is a piece titled How a Shorter American Workday is Hurting Income Inequality, offers two possibilities for why low-income workers are working fewer hours. It could be that employers are offering low-wage hourly workers fewer hours and no overtime, dooming them to lower earnings. 
or it could be that stagnating or declining real earnings reduce people's incentives to work more hours. The Atlantic declines to say which it thinks is more likely, seemingly not noticing that the latter reason doesn't make any sense at all. Why would earning less money mean that people choose to work fewer hours if their cost of living has not decreased? Nor does it bother to take into consideration unemployment statistics, which might, you might think, be relevant to consider how many hours of work are available to be worked. So, what does this tell us about The Atlantic? It was an early adopter of the switch from print to digital that many publications are only adopting now, and as such has managed to capture a significant audience, experimenting with new media and reaching a whole new audience. Its image has changed somewhat, but the underlying drive and politics remain the same. A magazine for middle class, educated, centre-left liberals, anxious about what's next for America, and confused by the politics of the young people, who are not anxious like the Atlantic's readers, but angry about the future they face.